just in case um, anybody doesn't know, I don't, I don't know if anybody here is not connected via Facebook or wasn't here last week or, or something. Um, I had to have immediate surgery a week ago Friday, um, just real sudden. It was really a surprise. Thursday, I went in to see the doctor. Had a, I'll spare you from some of the details, but had something bulging from my abdomen that was very, very painful. Went to see the doctor. The doctor didn't send me off to any kind of tests, you know, any kind of scans or x-rays or anything, and took me, told me to go see the surgeon. And the surgeon said, did you have lunch? And I said, yes. That was at like 2 o'clock. And they said, well, then the next morning, you need to come in and have surgery. The fear was is that um, I, I had created a hernia, two different spots in my abdomen, and that there were most likely uh, intestines poking through, um, which could easily bind, and then there are a greater litany of issues that can happen if one of those tears, if you have a perforation, that kind of stuff. And so they went right into surgery. We thought, Kelly mentioned, I think she mentioned last week that it was a six inch incision. I was still in a belt kind of looking thing. It was a special girdle or something. I don't know, very awkward feeling for a while. Um, but it ended up only, the, the incision's about four or five inches. So, and um, which, you know, and it's healing up really good. I saw the surgeon on Friday. He was very impressed with how well I was healing. But I'm telling you guys, as a parent, it is killing me to not be able to pick up my children. Um, I can't even pick up my youngest, um, who's just a little over 20 pounds. I'm not even allowed to carry her. Um, and for those of you guys who are getting on me this week, just to let you guys know, Kelly decided that it was a good weekend to move the craft room. And so there she is carrying down full furniture and dressers down the stairs while I'm standing by knowing that I am absolutely worthless to her. Um, unable to do anything. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> oh snap! Um, so, um, in case you guys didn't didn't notice, uh, Matt is here this week. Um, yeah, we've been praying for this brother, man. He's been through a tremendous amount, not just physically, but being where he was over the last several months with a group of, of, um, of people in that VA hospital or rehabilitation center. He's mentioned to me on several occasions that it was not easy being there. So God has carried him through, though, and he's doing well. Um, so, but he still needs continued prayer. There's possibility they might have to have another surgery. They're hoping to maybe put a stent. He's got an artery blockage right here in his carotid artery. They're going to try to put a stent in there. We're hoping that that's all they have to do. In fact, we're just, we just need to keep praying that God can do what only God can do. I'm telling you, um, sometimes we don't discover how big God is until we are absolutely desperate um, for him to move on our behalf. And so we are in a series right now titled In the Fire. And um, the first week, we just talked about its reality. We talked about, the, the title of the message was really just, It is Real. And, and we talked about how we discover in life that, you know, it, that life is a struggle and life is a battle and life can be a challenge, but there should be an expect expectation that God can do incredible things, that God can move in incredible ways. And last week, Kelly did an awesome job. I'm so thankful that she was able to share with you guys about praise. Um, praise is powerful. It has a way of debilitating our fears. It has a way of uh, atrophying our, uh, our, our anxieties. The praise calibrates our life. You know, when we begin to praise God, when we begin to worship God, it helps us to realign our perspective. It reminds us about how great He is. It reminds us of how wondrous He is. It reminds us of how... Um, God, what God has done and what God will do. And a lot of us aren't even fully aware of just how much God has already done. And so there, there are so many things that we praise about, but when we begin to praise God in the face of struggle in this life, in the face of challenges and difficulties, it, it, can, it can align our perspective, it can help us. 
It can help us create a better understanding. It can help us focus in more accurately. It, it helps us to step back from the situation that we are full on in and recognize how big God is and how amazing God is. And this morning, I want to talk to you guys about pressure. Um, and I want to tell you something that might appear to be very, very strange to believe, but I want to help you guys understand that there are many times where we're better under pressure. Um, you know, this is the stuff that migraine headaches are made of. Some of you guys understand this. Life can arrive at you at such tense moments. You, you can you can find yourself so absolutely overwhelmed by the things that are going on around you that you don't even know how to exist without it. Um, pressure is inevitable and unpredictable. I mean, it, it comes from any direction in life. It comes from any place. It's unpredictable. I mean, you, you just you don't know when it's going to come. You don't know how it's going to come. You don't, you don't know what's going to happen. You just know that whether it's work or your physical struggles or your money troubles or the, the house breaking or your children misbehaving, um, you know, it, it, can, it can come from any direction and every place in this life, but Many of us are living under an insurmountable amount of pressure. Now, I'm not telling you this morning that we should allow ourselves to be stressed and overwhelmed. I'm not suggesting today that pressure, though a normal part of our human experience, is something that we should just allow to have its way with us. But pressure is real. It could be family. Um, just getting really personal for some married couples. It could be our sexual relationships. It could be money. It could be work, our clothes or lack thereof, our appearance, our bills, our kids, our government. Um, you know, we are watching uh, uh, right now on television, the news, uh, absolute unrest in our own country. People are being killed and it is causing riots and looting. I mean, it is, sometimes it's surreal. You look at the news and is this really happening? You know, is this, is this really what America is right now? It, it's, it's our fears. It's, it's food. It's church. It's the news. Um, Facebook, you know, I mean, seriously, social media is another pressure stressor in our life, it's expectation, outcomes, whatever the case may be. This is a crazy thing. We are so accustomed to pressure, and it's become a, such a normal part of our life experience that if we do not have it existent at one point or another, we don't know what to do with ourselves. We will find something that will cause stress because we don't know how to live without it. Like this last week, you know, I am nailed to the couch. You can't do anything. Um, and I am uh, not this morning. It'd be kind of funny, but I'm not on any medications right now. But for the earlier part of last week, I was on medication and I sat and I did nothing. And I'm telling you, it was hard. But for those of you guys who've experienced moments like that where something physical happened and, and you just, you're stuck on the couch, you're stuck on the bed, and you can't do anything, it can be absolutely overwhelming and frustrating. And, 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 um, you know, and, and, but it's, it's a normal part of our experience. And this is the problem, though, is that when we experience pressure, we want escape. We want out. We love the concept of a of a drive through Jesus where you just kind of wander into church or you can, um, and no, no disrespect, you know, I know some of us need pills, but you want to just pop a pill and it'd be over, you know, for you to be okay. Um, you know, a lot of people just, they, they want, they want to drive through experience where they can just say, okay, passionate goosebump kind of moment. God took it away. <sighs> 
instead of allowing God to do what God needs to do in that moment, instead of realizing that God is trying to do something permanent in our life, where God is trying to work in us and others of us. You know, you've experienced this because maybe you in your own life have. You've experienced this because of um, your friends or your peers, your family members, but they, people will turn to just about anything. If they can't find meds that'll help them deal with it, they'll drink. You know, my mom smoked for a long, 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 long time. And I thought it was ludicrous to assume that smoking a cigarette would actually alleviate stress, but it does. Because when she first quit, when she finally decided that that habit was done, that she was kicking it, I mean, it was hard for her. She stressed out a lot. She was overwhelmed. She was, she was struggling with different things, you know. Um, and, and if we're going to talk about substances, let's talk about food, too. You know, I mean, some of us, we're not, it, it's not a drink of alcohol or necessarily some kind of um, a substance like that. You know, we, we indulge in whatever area. It could be eating too much and so on. It's just whatever it takes, we want an escape. We want out. We love to look at God as our convenient um, refuge. I mean, I know he's a refuge, and I know he's a place to hide in time of trouble. I know that he's our our, uh, support and our strength. But if we see him only as our quick escape, we're missing so much of what he wants to do in us and through us. Let me word it this way. Would you believe me if I told you that finding an escape is the worst thing to do? It's not at all the Lord's nature to send us through trials in vain. You see, he's using the struggles that we face to draw us closer to him. He's using our challenges and our difficulties to bring us into more intimacy, to create a greater depth in our character. And that's not easy. Well, what if I told you that the best choice is to stay in it instead of fighting our way out of it? Because we're better for it. We can be absolutely better for it. I'm going I'm to say four points I'm going to read to you guys from the book of Acts. Let me give you a little bit of a backdrop. Um, you know, the, the pressure can either work for us or against us. Or the setting in this text is Jerusalem. It's the book of Acts chapter 5. It's right after the resurrection of Jesus. Thousands of people are coming to Christ and becoming followers. And the situation is not going unnoticed by Jewish leaders. In fact, the apostles had been arrested and warned on several occasions to not say anything more about Jesus. They were facing religious and political pressure. And I mean, it's not all the Jewish leaders. There was this guy, Gemimel, who was a teacher of the law that suggested toleration, but they were so pervasive and violent with the disciples that they would experience 40 lashes in an attempt to show them how wrong they were. And it was common. These were people that perfected capital punishment. Um, These were people that perfected the process of creating agony in criminals. It was common for people to not even survive the lashings. And so here they are in this pressure situation. They're overwhelmed by their experience. I mean, they are going head into what God had commissioned them to do, fighting the good fight, praying, believing, trusting God for miracles, And these men, instead of saying, God, why did you do this to me? Some of us, we ask God for his direction. We pray for his will. And as soon as we we experience his will, as soon as it happens to us, we beg him to get out of it. It happens. Be real, I've been there. Acts 5, starting with verse 27. It's on the screen there, too. It says, then they brought the apostles before the high council where the high priest confronted them. He gave them strict orders never again to teach the man's name. He said, instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. 
But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. <laughs> right to the point. And then God put him in the place of honor at the right hand of his, as prince and savior. He did this so that the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. When we are witnesses of the, these things, as so is um, the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey him. And when they heard this, the high council was furious. And they decided to kill them. But one member, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, who was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people, stood up and ordered that the men be sent outside the council chamber for a while. Then he said to the colleagues, men of Israel, take care what you are planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there was a fellow, Theodos, who pretended to be someone great. About 400 others joined him, but he was killed, and all his followers went their various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. After him, at that time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee who got people to follow him, but he was killed too, and all his followers were scattered. So my advice is leave these men alone, let them go. If they are planning if they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. It never was. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourself fighting against God. The others accepted his advice. Wise people. They called the, into the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them... Never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach the me this message. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is Messiah. It's crazy. I mean, look at the situation these guys are enraged, they're outraged, they're frustrated, they're angered. And, and these apostles must know that when you enrage religious leaders, it's going to get you killed. Their savior just was nailed to a cross for the same thing. And so, but they, they are so compelled, so full of and alive of the truth that was in them, that nothing was going to stop them. And they discovered these four points we're going to mention here helped, will help you understand what happened in their life to, to just expose this greater, um, th this greater passion and drive when they were under pressure. And number one, pressure brings clarity to life. In verse 29, they said, we must obey God rather than any human authority. And I, I know at first, we would naturally assume that pressure blurs life. Um, for those of you guys who experience headaches because of the amount of pressure and stress that you experience in life, you understand what it means to not be able to have clear vision, not, not, just, not just emotionally and spiritually, but physically as well. You can, you can face moments where you are absolutely overwhelmed by the amount of pressure in your life and you're listening to a pastor tell you that pressure can bring clarity and you're thinking, that's impossible. I, I, I just, you know, you, you think of, you know, you think of pressure whittling you down and making you tired and making you exhausted and making it hard to see, but, but it's, I'm determined to believe that pressure can clarify life and priorities but it you know it it comes in on you it, it it pressure reveals what is true of us pressure reveals what is true around us it's this it's this it has this way of revealing who we really are and some of us it is a very very uncomfortable reality that we come to 
when we are under pressure. We don't like the truth we discover. We don't like what it says about us. We don't like the details that it has to say about where we are and where we need to be. Am I selfish or selfless? Do I want what's best for me and easiest for me, or do I want what's best for the world around me? Will I sacrifice what I have for others? Listen to this statement. Pressure can bring us to our knees, but in doing so, if we are humble, our life will gain clarity. What matters most in life begins to surface. What we are meant for begins to become more clear. Like, um, you know, it, it's like this, this, this agony sometimes and this pressure and this stress. And it just, it's pushing, it's pushing, it's pushing, it's pushing. And sometimes if you pray and you see God and you allow him to humble you, it will bring you to a place where you discover what, not just what you're made of, but what's really important, what really matters what really makes sense for you. We've got all these different things that we're adding in. We don't even know how to live a normal life. We call it the American dream, but it's more like a nightmare. I got to have, I got to this, I want this. There are people that are going to an earlier grave or having more and more surgeries because they have worked themselves absolutely to nothing. And pressure can bring clarity. It can help you know what family is really about. And it it can help you understand how deeply you love your children and how important that spouse of yours is. Has this way of bringing clarity to life. The important part is is the humble word. Because it's not going to do that for you if you're not humble about it. If you're squirming and you're fighting and you're aggressively pushing against it, if you're telling God, I can't believe you did this to me, I want out of this, you know, you won't receive everything that he can do in you through it. You just won't. And this pressure can just, it, it, you know, to me, and this is a learning process. This is not easy. It's not something you just pick up right away to me. You got to pray about this. You got to ask God to help keep you humble because you find out what's important. It reveals your priorities and helps you align them. Number two, pressure focuses our message or the truth. In, in, the, in the story here, the, the apostles, they said in verse 31 and 32, they said, Then God put him in the place of honor at the right hand of the Prince Savior. And he did this so that people of Israel would, rep, would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey him. Standing before the Jewish Sanhedrin, the apostles spoke of the gospel in succinct words. Their message was clear. Their message was right on. Their message was absolutely about the gospel. There's this new um, ministerial association that's beginning to gather, and I'm truly excited about the, the passion of these pastors to remain faithful to the entire text of the scripture. We, we are living in a world right now where lines are being blurred, where the truth is being manipulated, where things uh, that the Bible have to say are being distorted. And changed. We've got our own gospel at times. There's a, there, there's, a, there's a trend. It's kind of like this smorgasbord, if you call it, of religion. Where you just can go to the buffet and pick out what you want. Your little cliche statements and what sounds nice. I mean, people that don't even profess or know God are... No scripture because it sounds convenient and comfortable. And pressure has this way of burning away what's not real. And pressure has this way of destroying 
what is not real. If you're, if you're reading this story, remember that the, the Gemimiel said, if this isn't real, it'll die. I mean, these other guys believed that they were professing the truth, and, and you saw what happened after their leaders were gone. Everything faded and went away. And here we are, still this many years later, meeting in churches, talking about the Jesus Christ who came and died and resurrected and continues to live in us, his Holy Spirit empowering us. And the truth is, is that the stronger the pressure, the harder it is at times. When you find yourself in moments where you have to draw the line, you will find that the truth will rise to the surface. The Bible makes it very clear that every word written in it will never disappear. It will never pass away. It will never be gone. It will never come back void. When we think of pressure, we don't think of it, of it focusing our perspective, our, our, our perspective on the truth, but it, it does. Pressure has a way of sharpening, bringing something that is elaborate into simplicity. Pressure brings focus. When these guys were standing before their accusers, they had to say what they needed to say. I mean, it, it, was, it was specific. It was succinct. It, they, they had to say what absolutely needed to be said and nothing else. It didn't need fluff, it didn't need sugar, it didn't need watered down, it was the truth. They exposed those people for what they did to Jesus in that moment. And I'm not telling you to walk out there and knock people over the head with, with, with the Bible and, and, and that kind of stuff, because that's not what I'm talking about. Some people, forget it, some people say that, that you know, like, I'm going to stand for the truth. Sometimes we focus more on making a point than making a difference. I'm not telling you to run around screaming at the top of your lungs with picket signs how wrong the world is. But what I am telling you is that there is in our world an attempt to perverse the word of God. And pressure will help you define it. Pressure will help you define the lines. Pressure will help you you know, it, it'll help you fight for what's real. It, you know, like like boiling. Anybody who's ever had to boil anything, you know that it it removes the impurities and it brings what is pure out. You know, like when when um, any of our kids were still using nookies or whatever you call them. You know, you would boil them to get everything, all the the you know the different bacteria and stuff like that off of them. And what was okay for that baby to have inside of them that wasn't going to hurt them, that wasn't going to harm them, that was going to be okay for them, they were able to use. And just like that, when, when we find ourselves at a boiling point, when, when those lines are drawn and we have to stand for the truth, pressure has a way of re revealing what is true. What is true. Um, I love this, but pressure doesn't deter or hide the truth. It actually refines it and empowers it. Like, it's crazy because these guys, these, you would think that their message would lose its luster and it would lose its power and it loses passion after being in several incidents and imprisoned and killed and stuff like that. And did you notice that with every catastrophic and traumatic event that they faced that it actually gained momentum? that the truth actually became, a, you know, when, when, when they scattered, they were hoping that they would scatter the people and the message would stop. But when they fought against the disciples and the apostles, when they scattered, it actually made the message spread into farther regions, into farther places. It multiplied. And so don't be afraid that when someone comes to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with you, I live in a church, parsonage, and the, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses still stop by. <laughs> they never come in and talk, but <laughs> um, anyway. Number three, um, pressure is an occasion for joy. I know, that's crazy. Um, in verse 40, it says, The others accepted his advice, and they called the apostles and had them flogged. 
And then they ordered them to never again speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. There's this paradox. It doesn't make sense that you would experience joy in the fire. It doesn't make sense that having pressure in your life would cause you to experience joy. But I am discovering over and over and over again in my life that pressure reveals that God is working. And that's something that I should have joy about. That, that's something that I should be excited about. That's something that I should be thrilled about. That, that, that God is doing something big, that God is up to something, that God is moving in some way or another, that he is shaping us and forming us. And I tell you, when, when, when it was time for, you know, when, when Thursday hit and Friday morning and I'm laying in that bed and I'm like, this is not right. I'm not okay with this. I mean, some of you guys know, and these are just little details, but, you know, my family was here on vacation. My sister was hospitalized because her pancreas and liver were failing. And then right after that, the engine on my Blessing 86 Astro van blew up. And then right after that, I'm in a hospital room I'm about to be sliced open. And I'm like, what gives? Come on, God. And some of you are like, that's nothing. <laughs> and I know, I know. I know, because some of you, man, you've been through it. You've been through it. And God was just like, I'm doing something. I'm doing something. I'm doing something. I'm working on something here. You know, and, and uh, you know, I, I know Lorette's not here this morning, but she came that morning, and, and she's like, just think, Pastor, you'll have a whole new perspective the next time you enter a hospital room to stand and pray with someone. You'll know what they're going through. It's like, Yes. Okay. Oh, man, God was, God, honestly, God was humbling me this last week. I couldn't, and I still can't. I mean, this stool that I'm sitting on, I had to have my wife put it on the platform. Come on, really? You know, I'm like, this stinks, <laughs> you know? And it's tough. It's tough. And one of the things that God told me this last week, and you're going to say, what? That's not very nice of him. Um, is that you're not that important. The world's going to go on without you. It's okay. You know, like, like, I'm like, I'm like desperate. Last week, I'm like, baby, you got to let me go to church. My church needs me. I'm like, no, you know, no, they don't need you, Seth. They need God. And she loved me enough to tell me that. Stay home. They'll be okay. It's going to be all right. And I mean, you know, it's not that God is demeaning or belittling because we're, we're valuable to him. We're special. We're the apple of his eye. You know, he sent his son. His son came willingly to set us free. Absolutely. But, but you know, he was working in me to humble me. And if God, if, 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 if something is happening in your life that you don't like, turn it over to him and recognize that he is up to something. Nine years of ministry experience. Some of you guys have heard some of this story. It was not fun. I went into my first youth pastor slash associate pastor, man, with all kinds of delusions of grandeur. <laughs> and it was hard. I didn't realize how tough it was going to be. I didn't expect ministry to be like that. You know, I mean, there were times when when I was just at a wit's end and exhausted. And then I would come to this point where God would reveal just how sufficient his grace is in my weakness. And when we don't like what's happening, when we don't like what's going on, when we are uncomfortable with what he's doing, let it be an experience for joy because he's up to something. He's moving. He's working. You know, there are moments that it's just unfortunate reality of life. And sometimes you did something and you're like, I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go for God. And then people start laughing and calling you names and calling you fanatical or whatever. And you're like, oh, what did I do? You know, I didn't deserve this. And these guys were being flogged. 
You know, they were being beaten. And they're like, yes, <laughs> this is right where I'm supposed to be. They counted it an honor to be beaten for the message that they had. There's something that erupts in our hearts if we let it, to know that we are fully in his will, being worked on. It's a revelation of his love. It's a reminder that we have feelings. It shows that we have hunger. It's a burst of hope within us. It's God is refining you, that God is working on you, that God is doing something. Uh, what my my um, home church pastor, I was watching some of his messages late night last night online, and, and um, he, he said this, he made this very profound statement. He said, your place of brokenness becomes God's point of access. And it's so clear. Your place of brokenness becomes God's point of access. And so many of you who have experienced real brokenness knows what that means. And number four, pressure fosters our determination or passion. And for, verse 42, and every day, even after what had happened, even after how they'd been threatened and warned in the temple, and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. And pressure can heighten our resolve. I understand the definite fear that we'll con will succumb to it, but pressure and fire, this, 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 this moment of, of you know, struggle and battle, this, this tension in our life, we should allow it to be a catalyst. I mean, how many people have you seen overwhelmed by a diagnosis, but it not only you know, empowered them, but it just made them passionate beings where there were so much more adamant about living life, about being absolutely committed to what God had designed them to do. I, I, did, a, I did a message series a number of years ago in, in a former church, and it was titled uh, 40 Days to Live. What if you had 40 days? What would you do? differently. I mean, we know the scripture says that tomorrow is not promised, but we live every day like we have a million more. I mean, we waste moments all the time. I mean that in love because I do too. And God, God, you know, God, when, when, when pressure happens and when it reveals who we are and we come to some places of perspective and reality and we begin to understand the truth and and so on, I mean, it can just be a place where our faith is solidified, where our faith is just empowered and strengthened. Um, you know, we, you know don't, don't think that the, the apostles never faced difficulty. I mean, John the Baptist himself, the one, the forerunner before Jesus, the one who went out and screamed, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, he was in prison right before his beheading, and he sent messengers from his camp to go to Jesus, find the story, to go to Jesus to make sure that he was indeed the Messiah. He had a moment of uncertainty. He was scared that he wanted to be certain if he was going to lose his head that there was a right reason for it. And if you look in the Old Testament, you'll see some of the prophets stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with pagan idol worshipers, and then the next day hide under a broom tree or whatever and say, God, take me, curse the, the, my mother's womb in the day that I was born. There are going to be moments where we feel overwhelmed and pressured and struggle with, with clarity and struggle with that perspective, but, but God wants us to allow ourselves when the pressure comes, when the heat comes, when it gets intense, that it actually fosters our determination. Uh-uh. No, I'm not going to let this win. I'm not going to let this happen. I'm not going to lose my focus. I'm not going to lose my trust in Jesus. I know that he's got a plan that's bigger than I am and a way that's bigger than me. And, and I am going to allow this pressure and this difficulty and this challenge in my life to focus me in and make me determined 
I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight. The little kid, Randall, that I talk about all the time, was, you know, my, my son's middle name is named after this little boy who had a, had a brain tumor. Man, you, know, you would think you'd be discouraged and overwhelmed, and it, it f- fostered this kid's determination. He lived every part of his life with meaning and purpose and intentionality. And because of the tumor, he had the mind of a six-year-old when he was nine. I loved that kid to pieces. He was amazing. It fostered his determination. Some of you guys have seen people go to their very last breath determined. And we sometimes think that they lost their battle. They didn't lose anything. They won. And so when you, when you find yourself with under pressure and, and, and in the fire and overwhelmed, during this turbulent time, the church never, never lacked volunteers. They just grew and grew and grew and grew. And I know that we are living in a time, some people are just like, church is losing its influence. America's going to hell in a handbasket. It's all over. And I know that. I know how that feels. I feel that way sometimes. I turn on the news and I'm like, what next? Come on. And we get, we get kind of wishy-washy and soft when that stuff happens. And it should foster our passion. Not to, not to be belligerent. A passion to love people. To prove that Christ's love is unconditional should foster our passion and our determination to be there as a light and a proof that God exists, that he's real, and he's interested. And not just interested, but absolutely adores every human being. That he wants to know them and love them. This pressure that you experience in life, this I, I don't want to be a downer or anything, but it's inevitable. It's, it, you can't avoid it, guys. You can't. I hate that, too. You know, and I mean, there, there are moments of sabbatical. I mean, God wants you to have a Sabbath. God wants you to go be able to rest and, you know, regain your strength and your energy and your resolve and stuff like that. I'm not telling you that. But I'm telling you that there are, you know, sometimes the hits just keep coming. And you're thinking, what next? And God's just like, just fall on your knees already. Okay? Just just fall on your knees already. Stop fighting. And let me do this. Let me do what I want to do. Let me, let me perfect you. Let me change you. Let me do what I need to do. Fire is hot. Fire is hot. But in the hot fire, what is real, what matters, surfaces, and the rest is burned away. And you guys have experienced moments in your life before where what really matters comes out into the open as a result of what you face, and you thank God for the trauma. You thank God for the difficulty. You thank God that he trusted you enough with that. If we approach correctly, pressure reveals the power of God. Let me ask you two questions, just real simple questions. Do you currently feel absolutely overwhelmed about today? What do you feel absolutely overwhelmed about today? Just be real with yourself. Be real with God. Is it a diagnosis? Is it a family member? Is it family members? And don't 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 fear like my my struggle is, you know, you know like so and so is struggling with cancer and and I have this anxiety issue. Don't, don't for a second let the devil tell you that what's pressuring you is not valid. 
okay? It doesn't matter what it is. God is concerned about it. He is. The kid's not sleeping. Money not there. Whatever it is. Let's be real. Not fitting in with your peers. For you, some of you young people in here, school is a prison yard sometimes. It's tough. Where are you at? What do you feel overwhelmed about today? And secondly, how can you trust God with it right now? I mean, you knew we were getting here. <laughs> you knew this is where we were headed. I believe wholeheartedly that God wants to take whatever that is that's just stressing and straining you. He wants to take the anxiety from you. He wants to take the, the fear out of you. He wants to help you find rest for your soul. But in the moment of pressure, in that moment of where, where things are on fire and you just feel trapped, he wants to remind you of how big and powerful he is and what he wants to do, what he wants to accomplish. It's not enough to define it. You've got to trust him with it. Because he can't do what he wants to do until you submit it to him. God will not force it out of your hand. Coming to him is a choice that you make. And you need to take that thing or group of things or life dilemma or whatever you've been sitting with for however long you've been sitting with it and just say, here it is. Here it is. It's yours. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for truth. I thank you, God, that you allowed me to be here to share this with people today. God, I know that the people in this room are facing things. Every one of us have pressure in our life. There's something going on, something that's determined to knock us out. And God, you're simply telling us to drop to our knees Humble ourselves to you so that you can go to work, that you can shape us, that you can remake us, that you can form us into who you want us to be. Lord, help us not to be afraid or overwhelmed. Help us not to find ourselves anxious and frightened by the pressure that we're facing, but that we would completely entrust it to you, God, and watch as you do something truly marvelous. God, sometimes we want out of it so bad. I pray, God, that we would stop trying to fight for an escape and that we would just grab the hand that you've already extended to us so that you can walk with us through this. Help us to stop squirming and just trust you, God. That we would be better under pressure. And that it would make us better people. Like the early apostles who trusted you completely and it created vigor and more passion for what they did. You are so awesome, God. Amen.